Hello, welcome to this uh, session. Today we're going to begin a new uh, subject or a new uh, chapter, which is a physical uh, layer uh, in the context of wireless sensor uh, networks. Before we uh, begin the uh, subject matter, I'd like to give you a summary of what we have been doing uh, so far. Uh, in the beginning, we divided the lecture wireless sensor networks into two uh, building uh, blocks. The first was concerned with uh, a wireless sensor node, whereas the second uh, was a wireless sensor network. The first uh, building block puts in place the necessary uh, preconditions to establish uh, a wireless sensor uh, network. So the, a wireless sensor node, uh, we uh, in, in the section uh, on wireless sensor node, we uh, discussed about the node architecture, both hardware and software architecture. We uh, discussed about uh, selecting and integrating uh, sensors uh, in a wireless sensor node and uh, different types of operating uh, systems for wireless sensor uh, network. We have finished this three um, uh, constituting uh, chapters on wireless sensor node. Uh, today we're going to focus on setting up a wireless sensor uh, network. Um, that means uh, we're going to focus on the protocols and algorithms uh, needed to set up uh, a wireless sensor uh, network. So we're going to uh, begin with the physical layer. In a typical computer network architecture, the organization of uh, protocols is upside down. At the bottom, we have the algorithms needed to uh, establish point-to-point uh, -point, uh, communication. These algorithms are uh, discussed in the framework of uh, phys the physical layer. Then the MAC layer protocol is responsible for managing a wireless medium and also for managing the, the radio chip to turn it on and uh, off and to make sure that packets are successfully uh, delivered between two communicating uh, partners uh, and for sending acknowledgement. Then the network layer is responsible for supporting uh, multi hop communication. The uh, application here uh, included in the application layer is also the transport layer, which is responsible for uh, preparing the data in the form of uh, packets so that uh, packet-based communication can uh, take place. The, here we have three different uh, blocks. The one in the middle is responsible for um, uh, relying or uh, forwarding uh, packets when two communication partners cannot communicate uh, directly. Uh, so the dashed line uh, signify logical communication uh, to make sure that packets are uh, delivered, uh, packets are received and forwarded to the right uh, recipient. Where are the solid line indicates the, the path a packet takes uh, from the source node to uh, a destination node. Uh, another important uh, uh, aspect we wish to address is uh, briefly summarize the advantages of uh, wireless communication before we move to the uh, physical uh, layer because there are certain advantage, uh, disadvantages or uh, challenges uh, we should overcome to support uh, wireless communication. Uh, wireless communication is preferred over uh, wired communication in, um, wire, in as far as uh, setting up a sensor network. Uh, the first advantage is the ease with which we can deploy the, the sensors. Uh, we don't need to disrupt uh, the environment's uh, normal operation. For example, if we want to deploy sensors on a bridge or inside a building, uh, this can take place 
without affecting the normal functioning of the building or the, the bridge. This type of flexibility is quite desirable, especially if the deployment is uh, short term or even um, uh, long term. The second uh, important aspect with wireless communication that uh, mobility of the sensor node uh, can be supported. If, for example, we uh, deploy the sensors um, on a human body to uh, sense some vital biophysical um, uh, signals, then it is possible uh, that human beings can freely move in their everyday environment at home, in rehabilitation centers, uh, or even in office. So uh, this type of flexibility is quite uh, desirable and uh, not possible with uh, wired uh, sensors. Another important aspect uh, is uh, we can place the sensors in uh, places or in areas which are uh, inaccessible to wired uh, installment. This type of flexibilities are quite desirable. After the deployment, it is also possible to rearrange the placement of nodes uh, to optimize, for example, uh, connectivity, uh, power consumption, end-to-end -end latency of packet transmission, uh, and so on. But this type of flexibility comes uh, with uh, certain challenges or at a price. Uh, for example, uh, wireless medium, a transmission of a wireless uh, medium is energy consuming compared to a wired uh, medium. That means because of power limit, uh, bandwidth uh, can be limited. Uh, communication range can be limited. Uh, the packet delivery success uh, rate of packet delivery is relatively poorer uh, in, wired, uh, in wireless uh, environment. We should also take into account uh, noise coming from the surrounding, interference coming from the uh, surrounding. Uh, all these challenges uh, are included in uh, uh, wireless uh, networks. And the physical layer is mainly responsible to surmount uh, these challenges. For this uh, lecture, our main focus is going to be on short range point to point uh, communication because the physical layer is responsible to make sure that packets are successfully transmitted between two directly communicating uh, partners. The, the transmission range we are interested in is about uh, you know, below 150 uh, meters. Uh, and the power budget uh, is in the uh, order of one watt. Okay, I have organized the, the, the lecture as follows. First, I will give you uh, a brief overview of the main components of a wireless, since, uh, a wireless communication uh, system. Then we will uh, see in more detail uh, the, the components of a transmitter and a receiver. Uh, but our main uh, focus will be on the transmitter because the process will be in reverse order, but more or less the same uh, at the receiver. So here we're going to consider channel encoding, source encoding, and uh, modulation. These are the most important aspects of the physical layer. We will also take time to discuss about signal propagation over a wireless uh, medium. All right. The main components of a wireless communication system, uh, main, here we are talking about a digital communication system, are just three. The transmitter, the channel, and the receiver. The transmitter produces the packet and transmits them. The 
packet will be represented in the form of electromagnetic signal and propagates over a wireless uh, channel. Uh, this electromagnetic signal will be intercepted by the antenna of the uh, receiver, um, will be changed into bit streams, and then uh, the original uh, message will be reconstructed at the receiver. The main challenge is the channel because the channel distorts the signal, uh, introduces its own noise, uh, so that it is the responsibility of both the transmitter and the receiver to make sure that all these challenges are overcome and the uh, packets are successfully received. Some devices, uh, this uh, certainly uh, includes uh, wireless sensor nodes, combine the functionalities of both the transmitter and the receiver, in which case uh, we are talking about uh, transceivers. So here's the letter written in red, uh, at the transmitter, trans, or the, the, the part of the letter written in red, trans, and the part of the uh, word written in red at the receiver, which is receiver, combined together, yield the word uh, transceiver. A transceiver is a device which is capable of both transmitting and receiving. He, this uh, uh, figure displays a complete uh, overview of both the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, as I said, some, uh, some devices combine this uh, building block to uh, produce a transceiver, but we're going to uh, discuss them separately for the, sake of, uh, for the sake of making the lecture comprehensible. The source of data or message for our case are the sensors. The sensors, uh, transform uh, some form of energy uh, which is available in the environment into an electrical energy. And apart from the, the four, uh, the two forms of energy uh, represent one in the same thing. So essentially, uh, the form of energy and uh, there is a change in the amplitude, otherwise, uh, in most cases, the frequency stays unchanged because it is in the frequency we extract the footprint of the, the process we wish to uh, monitor. This signal is typically analog signal. It has to be changed into a digital signal. Uh, we ha I have uh, given you the justification when we discuss about the uh, a wireless sensor node. The, the reason the analog signal should be changed into uh, a digital signal is not only because we are dealing here with uh, digital communication, but also all the, the component inside a wireless sensor node are digital uh, systems. The processor, for example, understands only digital um, beta streams. So it is uh, plausible to transform the analog signal um, into digital bit streams. And the responsibility of this is the source uh, encoder. When we are talking about uh, communication or digital communication in general, the next step is the channel encoder. The purpose of the channel encoder is to make sure that the signal we, pre uh, we uh, transmit over a wireless, a medium is robust to noise and amenable to uh, reconstruction. So here, the, the channel encoder deliberately um, uh, inserts redundant information uh, in order to make sure that the, 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 the data or the signal we, we propagate uh, cannot easily be uh, corrupted. And if it is corrupted, uh, one way or the other, it is possible to um, recognize error and in some cases uh, correct this error. The modulator is responsible 
two, it has two main purposes. First, uh, it trans, uh, transforms uh, the digital bit streams back to analog signal because analog signals are relatively easier to transmit than uh, digital signals. In fact, uh, to purely transmitting uh, a digital signal requires infinite uh, bandwidth, which is not available. So uh, there is a need to transform the, the digital bit stream uh, back to the um, analog signal before the signal leaves the transmitter. And another important aspect or uh, important assignment of the modulator is to transform this uh, bit stream in such a way that detection is easier. So the module, the purpose of the modulator, as I told you, is twofold. First, changes in the, the, the bit streams back to analog signal so that uh, signal propagation is easier. Second, uh, it uh, makes sure that the uh, signal can be detected easily or uh, we can put in place relatively simple circuits uh, to uh, retrieve or detect the, the signal. We're going to see uh, modulation in more detail, or all, all of these uh, components in more details. Finally, the power amplifier is responsible for boosting the, the power of the um, signal being transmitted so that it can resist attenuation absorption and many other challenges uh, coming from the physical uh, environment. On the other side, this signal has to uh, uh, be received when it's received at the receiver. Uh, typically, the, um, the, the power level is low, the signal uh, is attenuated, uh, maybe uh, corrupted, uh, additional uh, signal have uh, joined. Uh, so th th first the RF front end amplifies the, the, the signal in, uh, at, uh, uh, to an appreciable uh, level. Then some conditioning circuits uh, uh, remove all the undesired, uh, undesirable uh, signals, uh, filter the signal, and uh, make the signal ready for um, subsequent digital uh, processing. Uh, it, it goes, uh, this signal uh, goes through the demodulator uh, to separate the carrier from, from the message. Then the redundant information should be removed by the channel decoder and then the source encoder uh, or the source decoder uh, reconstruct the original signal before the signal is passed to the sync, the information uh, sync. In most cases, we don't need to reconstruct the original signal. We don't, because we just use uh, pros, uh, processors or microcontrollers to, to process the, the, the data in the application consuming the uh, signal are also digital applications running on the, um, uh, on the wireless sensor node or uh, on a computer. Uh, so they understand uh, digital data, so there is no need um, to pass the, uh, the data to a source uh, decoder. But for the sake of completeness, these are uh, the components of the, the receiver. In the subsequent uh, parts of this uh, lecture, we're going to see these components uh, one by one uh, uh, in some detail. Okay, uh, when we discussed components of a wireless sensor node, we have uh, discussed in detail about the analog to digital converters. Uh, and uh, we have uh, seen how we uh, sample the uh, analog signal. We have discussed about quantization error and how we can minimize uh, quantization error. We have discussed about Nyquist theorem, which uh, tells us how to sample the analog signal so that no information uh, 
uh, should be lost. I'm not going to repeat this in in detail. Uh, if you need uh, some more information, please go back to the lecture on wireless sensor node and uh, refer the slides there. Uh, it suffices here to discuss about uh, two type of source encoding, two type of transforming the analog uh, signal into digital signal. In a pulse code modulation, the analog signal will be uh, made uh, discrete both in time and in amplitude. And each symbol the 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 or each sample we took from the analog signal will be mapped to certain uh, discretized uh, level, and then this discretized levels or uh, symbols we represent using uh, binary digits. Uh, here is a a, a, a typical uh, example. The solid lines you see here is the analog signal we wish to uh, transform into bit streams. Uh, for this purpose, we have introduced four discrete uh, levels. This is uh, one, two, three, four. In order to uniquely represent these uh, four uh, discrete levels, uh, we need two binary bits, just two bits. So that zero, zero represents the, the, the lower level, zero, one represents the second, one, zero represents the third, and one, one represents the fourth. Just, you see that for four different levels, we just need two bits. And each symbol we sample at intervals, at regular intervals, and these intervals are uh, decided uh, by Nyquist's uh, sampling theorem. And these samples will be mapped to the nearest discrete level. Uh, for our case, for example, this one will be mapped to uh, zero one. Uh, this one will be mapped to one zero, and this one will be mapped to one one. So here, the, the, the difference between the actual level and the, the level we assigned to is called the quantization error. Uh, we can minimize the quantization layer, uh, sorry, the quantization level, uh, error, if we are willing to sacrifice more bits to represent the symbols. For example, if we decided to use three bits instead of two bits, then we can uh, segment this whole uh, amplitude into eight discrete levels. If we're uh, willing to add one more bit so that we can represent each symbol by four digits, then it is possible to introduce 16 discrete levels and so on. The, the compromise, as you can see, now we need more bits to represent symbols. Uh, this has effect on the communication latency, this has effect on the uh, storage or uh, memory we need to store the, the bit strings. Another interesting uh, um, source encoder is the uh, delta uh, modulator. The delta modulator transmits or stores only the difference between the present sample and the sample before it, only the difference. For example, here is the, the, the analog signal we have seen uh, previously in the delta modulation. First, this is the, the zero, zero level. We have to represent this uh, level, the beginning, with certain amounts of bits, according to the um, quantization error we are uh, willing to uh, accommodate. For example, if we use just one, one one bit so uh, zero is the, the the beginning then the the next sample here you see is just one step different from the the previous one 
So we can signify this one step difference either by zero or one. For example, if it's an incremental difference, we can assign one to signify that it's uh, an incremental uh, difference in one step. Or if it was, for example, falling down, we can uh, represent this by zero. So every time, depending on the, the, the number of steps, uh, the, the, the difference in the number of steps, we can use either one or zero, or we can add additional uh, digits to signify how big the, the difference is. Most low power radio chips today use delta modulation because it is relatively uh, efficient because we don't need to transfer the whole, uh, we don't need to assign a whole bit array for a symbol, but we have to take the, the context into account if we wish to decode uh, delta modulation. So these two, pulse code modulation and delta uh, modulation are uh, widely used uh, source encoding techniques to transform the analog signal into digital uh, bit streams. Okay, we have seen source uh, encoding briefly. As I said, if you need uh, additional uh, information, please refer to the uh, chapter on wireless sensor node. Uh, otherwise, we will move on uh, to uh, channel encoding. Uh, when we transmit a signal over a wireless link, the signal can be corrupted uh, because of many reasons. Uh, if we just take a, a look at two of them, the first one is um, noise arising from, from the environment. Noise is energy. Uh, and the signal we propagate is energy. So if there is a, an interaction between these two uh, energies, of course, uh, the uh, end effect would be uh, modifying the desirable signal. Uh, interference is another uh, cause. Interference means signals coming, uh, electromagnetic signals coming from other sources, nearby uh, sources. They can interact with uh, our signal, uh, thereby modifying its inherent um, aspects. Uh, additional problems could be like absorption. Uh, water molecules in the air can also absorb the, the, the energy and modify uh, the signal. Reflection is another uh, problem. There are so many uh, factors which can affect the quality of a signal being uh, transmitted. So the source encoder the, is uh, put in place to make the uh, signal robust to all these type of uh, changes. Uh, and if it's inevitable that the signal has to be uh, modified uh, because of the harshness of the environment or the, the, the interference, uh, then we should be able to detect the error. We should be able to detect the flip uh, uh, of zero to one or one to uh, zero. And in some uh, cases, the channel encoder is also responsible to correct the, the error, uh, not only to recognize error, but also to uh, correct uh, the, the error. But this all require uh, history, uh, this all require some storage and also computation. For wireless sensor network, the main purpose of the, source, uh, the, the channel encoder is to make the signal robust and to recognize error. It's not the responsibility of the, the channel um, encoder to correct errors. In wireless sensor network, we don't correct error. If error is found, the whole packet will be rejected and retransmission will be requested because in terms of cost, this is the, the easier or this is the cheapest. The sacrifice we make is of course, uh, the, the, the extra uh, energy required to transmit the packet and the latency because packet retransmission uh, entails 
some latency in reconstructing the whole data. Uh, in order to uh, visualize the problem we face, imagine the wireless channel being a corridor. In this corridor, we wish to transport an object, a, a three-dimensional object. Okay, the corridor here, the, the, the y-axis signifies the maximum amplitude the signal is permitted to, to pass through this corridor. And the width of the corridor signifies the data rate or the bandwidth of the, the channel. Unless our packet fits into this corridor, it is not possible to transmit it or to, to bring it on the other side of the corridor. That means either a message will be uh, chopped off from, uh, you know, part of the, the, the packet will be chopped off or it will be uh, squeezed so that the, uh, the packet undergoes some form of deformation. So remember the, the challenge we face when it comes to point-to-point -point communication is twofold, okay? To adjust the amplitude and to adjust the, the data rate or the bandwidth of the message we wish to transmit. Mathematically, this is expressed by the shannon hartley uh, theorem, uh, the, which uh, expresses the capacity of a channel, the capacity of the, the corridor I just uh, described. The capacity of a channel is a function of the bandwidth of the channel and the signal to noise ratio. So it, mathematically speaking, this is B times logarithm to the base two of one plus S divided by N. S refers to the, the power of the signal and N refers to the, the power of the noise. How do we measure the power of the noise? We measure the power of the noise as follows. We have the receiver, we activate the receiver. In the absence of no communication, we just measure the uh, output uh, of the uh, receiving antenna. So the, the, the magnitude of this received signal in terms of uh, what is the, level, the, the background noise level. Again, we let the uh, uh, receiver receive useful packets and the received power as measured at the uh, end of the, the antenna is the signal's power and the ratio gives the signal to noise ratio. So here, we have two reasons or two uh, main uh, factors which can cause error. The first one is, as I said, the, the capacity of the channel. If the, the, the packet we transmit does not fit, either its amplitude or it is uh, uh, transmission rate doesn't fit into the, the, the channel, some information will be lost. This is depicted as equi equivocation. Equivocation means the uh, when information is uh, removed from the signal. So it has a subtractive effect. Or the noise level may be too big in the uh, equation we just described. That means if the noise level is too big, then energy is added into the electromagnetic signal. This energy will be understood as a form of misinformation. And this is an additive effect. So if the, 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 we transmit a packet and it cannot fit into the 
the channel information will be lost or if the noise level is too strong information will be added into the signal in both cases the condition is undesirable so we are going to see in more detail how the channel encoder attempts to overcome this uh, problem the first one as i told you uh, is to recognize the error the distortion or the inclusion of uh, information and if possible to correct it but we don't do um, error uh, correction uh, so we focus on either making the 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 the, the signal robust to noise by adding deliberately adding additional information or we uh, in case uh, error happens we try to recognize the error one thing i need to uh, mention is that uh, the, the channel encoder one of the strategies the channel encoder adapters uh, in order to make uh, error recognition easier is to use a code book. A code book simply means each and every symbol we wish to transmit will be represented by a known pattern. And if a pattern which is not known or which is a part of the the code book is received then we know immediately that error must have occurred during transmission so one of the the strategies for the channel encoder to recognize error is to use a code book this code book the 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 uh, the larger the size of the the code book the more expressive is the code book, but then the both the decoding and the encoding uh, process is going to be compute and storage intensive, also communication intensive. If we use a simple code book, transmission and receiving is going uh, are going to be easier or simpler, but then the code book is going to be not so expressive and it's going to be prone to error so there is a trade-off on one side on the expressive power of the code book but on the other on the computation cost of reading uh, from this code book and uh, recognizing error So after using a code book, the channel encoder also deliberately adds a chunk of bit or uh, amends or inserts a chunk of uh, bits so that when one of the, or some, some portion of the message is uh, modified, it's possible to detect this modification and correct this modification. After the, the, the channel encoder prepares the bit streams in, 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 in a manner I just uh, described, now the signal is ready to be transmitted. But the data we have now for transmission is a digital uh, is digital data or a digital bit stream. We cannot transmit a digital bit stream as it is because as I told you, uh, if we analyze the Fourier uh, transform of this um, bit stream, it requires infinite bandwidth and we don't have infinite bandwidth. We have to transform the digital bit stream to analog signal. This is the first 
the, per, the first assignment of the modulator. The second assignment is not uh, immediately uh, obvious, but it has something to do with the nature of the signal, the original signal coming from the sensors. The analog signal picked by the sensors or it's picked by a sensor is called a baseband signal. A baseband signal simply means the frequency of this signal is in the neighborhood of zero hertz. In other words, the bandwidth of this signal is significantly long. Uh, let me briefly describe a signal. A, a signal is the, a fluctuation of energy, or it, you can, in terms of uh, for electrical engineering student, a signal is the fluctuation of a voltage or the fluctuation of a current, mostly fluctuation of a voltage. This uh, fluctuation of voltage or this fluctuation of more abstractly uh, fluctuation of uh, energy is described in terms of uh, frequency, bandwidth, and uh, period. The, the, the frequency signifies how fast the signal changes, the, how fast the magnitude of the signal changes. If the, 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 the change is fast, the frequency is very high and the bandwidth is um, short. If the signal on the other hand fluctuates slowly, then we are dealing here with a small, uh, a, a low frequency and a large bandwidth. So let me repeat one more time. There is a, an inverse relationship between the frequency of a signal and the bandwidth of a signal. The frequency of the signal uh, uh, describes how fast the magnitude of a signal changes or how fast the energy or the, the voltage of a signal changes. If on the other hand, the wavelength is simply the distance between two peaks of the signal, the peak two peaks of a signal measured in meter uh, yields the bandwidth. If the signal is a high frequency signal, the peaks are close to each other, so the, band, uh, the bandwidth is short. If on the other hand, the signal fluctuates slowly, then the bandwidth is long, but the frequency is small. Now, there is also a direct relationship between the band between the wavelengths of a signal and the size of the antenna which detects this signal. You may recall that an antenna, a simple conductor, functions in accordance with Lenz's law or Faraday's law. That means if we have a conductor and a moving magnetic field cuts across this conductor, then an electric current will be induced in this conductor. And this is how we receive the electromagnetic signal. The, the, the magnitude of the current, as well as the direction of flow of this current depends on the, the direction of travel of the electromagnetic signal, as well as the strength of the electromagnetic field. So there is uh, a direct relationship between the antenna size and the uh, bandwidth uh, 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 on the, um, on the uh, wavelength of the signal. The shorter the wavelength, the longer the antenna size. 
sorry, the shorter the wavelengths, the shorter the antenna we require, the longer the wavelengths, the longer the antenna. Now remember, we don't need a long antenna because you know, we don't have the size or uh, we have discussed this when we discussed uh, architecture of a wireless sensor node. The antenna size should be typically in the range of centimeters. It should even be hidden. We mustn't see it. It should be unobtrusive. That means if the antenna size should be short, the wavelength should also be short. That means the frequency should be very high. But the signal coming from the sensors is typically a baseband signal with long bandwidth, uh, sorry, with long wavelength. So we have now a problem. The signal we harvest using sensors is typically of low frequency or long wavelength. But we cannot transmit this signal as it is, for otherwise we need a long antenna. But we don't want long antenna. So how can we reconcile this discrepancy? The purpose of the modulation is to solve this problem. Typically, the purpose of the modulator is to transform this baseband signal into a high frequency signal so that it is easier to detect this high frequency signal. But in doing so, we mustn't actually change the identity of the message signal. We mustn't tapper on the frequency of the message signal. So how is it possible to transform the baseband signal, the message coming from the sensor into a high frequency signal without actually changing its frequency? That is the assignment of the modulator. And if you ask me, one of the most significant revolutions of the 20th century is the discovery of modulation. It has made all aspects of communications possible. Satellite communication, mobile communication, wireless communications, all of them are possible mainly because of modulation. We're going to see how we can transform a baseband signal into a high frequency signal without changing the identity of the message signal. Uh, first, we need to have a carrier signal. A carrier is simply, as its name depicts or implies, a, a signal which carries the message we harvested from the sensors. And we want this carrier signal to be a simple signal, a signal which is amenable, which is conducive for mathematical manipulations. And this signal is typically a sinusoidal signal. So here I have a sine wave or a sine signal. A sine signal is described by three important uh, terms or three important aspects. The first one is the amplitude of the, the sine signal here. A note is the amplitude. This is the peak of the sinusoid signal. When, for example, sine um, when t is zero, assuming that the phase is also zero, then we have A naught. This is the maximum amplitude that can be achieved. Here, f is the frequency of the signal. Remember, the frequency of the signal determines how fast or slow the, the signal changes amplitude. And then we have the, the phase of the signal. The phase of the signal simply means the position in space. The position of the signal 
with respect to other signal, a reference signal. This position we depict with a degree from zero to 360 degree. Okay, the, the, the phase is simply important if we want to compare the position of the signal with respect to a reference signal, otherwise it's not interesting. Now, we can change this carrier signal, high frequency signal, in three different ways, in a way that is possible to recover the message. A, without touching the, the sign aspect here, we can make the message signal simply modify the amplitude according to the message. We can change the, the amplitude of the carrier according to the message. Here, for example, AM, this is the message signal you see here. It's an arbitrary signal. It can now change the amplitude of the signal. All the others remain intact or unchanged in which case we are talking about amplitude modulation. Amplitude modulation is the easiest type of modulation. Remember here, this means A naught times sine two pi ft plus theta naught. So here there is a multiplication implied. So that means now we can multiply the message signal with the carrier signal, just the multiplication. And then we have an amplitude modulation. A high frequency carrier carrying our message. Finally, at the receiver side, we can just separate these two. I'll show you how we can separate and then recover the, the message. This is amplitude modulation. But the problem with amplitude modulation is the following the amplitude of the signal changes according to the message. If the noise, for example, changes the amplitude of the, 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 the modulated signal, we, will, we may not be able to know because it is difficult for us to decide whether this change comes from a noise or from a message, which is why amplitude modulated signals are difficult to uh, process the quality of an amplitude modulated signal is not so good. But amplitude modulated signal can travel far and wide. So for satellite communication, for example, we use amplitude modulation. Alternatively, we can keep the amplitude intact so that if there is any change in the amplitude, we'll immediately know that this is the work of noise or interference or some undesirable cause. Instead, we can change only the frequency of the signal according to our message in a way that is recoverable. Here now we are talking about frequency modulation. Most local radio stations are frequency modulations because frequency modulation are high quality signals. Because as I told you, we keep the, the amplitude intact. If there is any change in the amplitude, it's easy to correct because it doesn't come from the modulation. And the frequency of the signal is not easily changeable. So it is robust to noise. But the detection of amplitude modulation or even the modulation process is not as straightforward as amplitude modulation. Or we can keep the frequency and the amplitude intact and change only the, the, the position of the, 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 the propagating signal according to the message. Sometimes we push it by 15 degree, sometimes by 45 degree, sometimes by 60 degree, and so on according to how strongly the message changes, in which case we're talking about phase modulation. 
but phase, phase modulations are extremely sensitive and they require highly complex radio chips, which is why we don't see them quite often in the market. These are special purpose military uh, devices. So we have here, if we change the amplitude of the carrier signal, we're talking about the amplitude modulation. If we're changing the frequency of the carrier signal, we are talking about frequency modulation. Or if we changing the relative position of the signal, according to the message, we're talking about phase modulation. Uh, Read uh, in more uh, detail if you need some, some more uh, information, read the slides. But in general, the, the message signal can be analog signal or digital signal. Regardless of the message, the carrier is always an analog signal. And this is how the, the modulator transforms any bit stream into analog signal. If we are talking about changing the, the, the carrier, the amplitude of the carrier signal using digital bit streams, we're talking about amplitude shift key. If we discreetly changing the frequency of the carrier according to the a digital bit stream, we're talking about frequency shift key. Or if we're changing the position of the signal according to a digital bit stream, we're talking about phase shift key. Otherwise, the principle, the essential principle remains the same. Either we're changing the amplitude, the frequency, or the phase of a high frequency signal. For our case, typically 2.4 gigahertz. So that it's easy to transmit and it is easy to detect. A modulator can be a coherent or non-coherent modulator. A coherent modulator simply means it requires a reference signal to retrieve the original signal. In most cases, the same color frequency, ideally with the same phase, is used to retrieve the original signal. I'll show you some mathematical expressions. If we don't need any reference signal, we are talking about non-coherent modulator. A modulator could be binary or keywari. Binary simply means we have digital uh, zero and ones to change either the amplitude or the frequency or the phase. If we are keywari, in most cases for, for quadrature amplitude modulation, then we have n discrete magnitudes according to which the phase, the frequency, or the amplitude of the carrier signal should be changed. Moreover, when we design a modulator, we can optimize the power to transmit the data or the bandwidth of the modulated signal so that the modulated signal does not consume a significant amount of the channel's bandwidth. So either we can optimize power or we can optimize um, spectrum. Okay, here I have already uh, discussed about the different aspects of a, a modulator, so I don't need to uh, repeat it, but uh, you can read the slides uh, more carefully. Now let's come to amplitude modulation to show you how uh, mathematics make uh, amplitude modulation extremely simple and interesting. So here we have two types of signals. We have the carrier signal, typically a sinusoidal wave of known frequency, known amplitude, and known phase. For the sake of simplicity, we set the phase, the relative position, to be zero. So we can get rid of it. Now we have a message also. For, for the sake of uh, simplicity, we're going to assume that the message to a baseband signal 
is a sinusoidal signal. In both cases, both of them are cosine waves. So here, the modulated signal can be described like this. As I told you, in amplitude modulation, the idea is to simply multiply the message signal with the current signal. Just multiplication. Why? Let me explain. Here, suppose this is the, the current signal. You see here, FC uh, uh, implies current frequency and FM implies uh, message frequency, the frequency of the message signal. So we have now cos 2 pi FCT at the carrier signal. Without any modulation, we should expect a, a peak, a, a node, or SC, for example. For, 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 for our case here, SC implies simply the peak amplitude of the carrier signal in the absence of any modulating signal. This would have been the, the, the clean carrier uh, signal. But now we change the magnet, instead of the, 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 the amplitude here, the peak amplitude, we just use the message signal. So that means the message signal is multiplied with the carrier signal to produce amplitude modulated signal. So now here we have a multiplication of two cosine waves here. You see cos here and cos here. So if you multiply cos x with cos y, you'll get cos x plus y plus cos x minus y using some trigonometry uh, identity. So that means instead of x, substitute 2 pi fmt, and instead of y, use 2 pi fct and then do a, a little operation. What we get is this signal. Okay, two cosine waves, addition of two cosine waves whose magnitude and frequency is described like this. Their magnitude is Sc times Sm over two and their frequency is once we have Fc plus Fm and once Fc minus Fm. This signal will be propagated. At the so, if we consider the uh, Fourier or the, the the spectrum of the message signal, as I told you, it's a baseband signal. The the frequency of the message signal is between this and this one. Okay, this is the Fourier uh, transform of the the baseband signal, showing you where the frequency of the message signal lies on the spectrum. For the current signal, this is what we have. The current signal has now two components, one Fc and one minus Fc. That means the current signal has just one single frequency. But the baseband signal doesn't have a, a, a single frequency because the message changes. Sometimes the energy fluctuates slowly. Sometimes the uh, energy fluctuates is relatively fast according to the process we are monitoring so that it consists of not just a singular uh, frequency, but uh, uh, many frequency components. After uh, amplitude modulations, this is what we get. Two different types of components. One at uh, the, the center being at Fc plus Fm, and the other at Fc minus Fm. So this is what we, we get. Now at the... Okay, this is, uh, it describes uh, uh, using uh, a figure how amplitude modulation functions. So this is our, our message. And this is the clean sinusoidal signal, which is our carrier. We don't change the frequency of the carrier. We just want to change the amplitude of the carrier according to the message. So if we multiply these two, this is what we get. So you see that essentially the frequency remains the same unchanged, but the magnitude changes now according to the message here. You see the magnitude here, it changes. This is what you read, for example, at the oscilloscope. If you examine the nature of an amplitude modulation, modulated signal. 
at the receiver side, what we just need to detect, remember amplitude modulated uh, modulation requires a coherent uh, modulation. At the receiver side, we need a carrier signal of the same frequency. And we multiply the received signal with the carrier signal, just another multiplication. And the trigonometry identity takes care of the retrieval of the original signal. How does it does? I will show you. Suppose the, at the receiver side, we have this signal. This is the carrier signal. Cos 2 pi f ct, the same carrier signal. We know about this carrier signal because we deliberately use this signal to modulate the message signal. And this is the modulated signal which we have received. And then we just multiply. Again, here you see that there is a cos. In this, we have two cosine waves. So if we multiply a cosine signal with cosine signals, this is what we get. So this is the, the modulated signal, you remember? And this is the current signal. So here, cos x times cos x, sorry, cos x times cos y, cos x times cos w. So if you do the, the, the mathematics, what we get is this one. One, two fc minus fm, another two fc plus fm, and the old message signal cleanly separated from the two high frequency signals, cleanly separated. This is the message signal now. And remember, the message signal is a baseband signal, a low frequency signal. All the others are high frequency signals. We just need to use an old low pass filter to get our message signal back. So simple is amplitude modulation. The detection as well as the modulation of the message signal using amplitude modulation. What we do, again, I will show, I'll show you using uh, a, a figure here. So this is the modulated signal, amplitude modulated signal. We need this reference signal to beat it with the amplitude modulated signal. And then we have to, first we use a, a rectifier. A rectifier simply remove one part of the signal, okay? Remove just the, 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 the negative part and then allows only the positive part. And then he, this signal you see has two components. One, a high frequency signal here, and another, a very low frequency signal. So we just need a low pass filter to retrieve our message back. This is how an amplitude modulation signal functions. Frequency and phase modulation, on the other hand, they, they change the frequency in the, the phase of the carrier signal, but the amplitude, the amplitude of the signal is intact. So here you see the, the, the frequency of the signal is changed according to the, the, the message signal for uh, frequency modulation. And for phase modulation, we do the, 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 the phase of the signal. We're not going to, see, uh, to consider this in, in more detail. If you need uh, more information on this, please uh, refer to uh, more advanced uh, books, uh, digital communication books on this subject matter. Amplitude shift keying, frequency shift keying, and uh, phase shift keying uh, are just another variants of uh, the original amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and uh, phase modulation. The only difference is that now the message is a digital uh, bit stream as opposed to uh, analog signal. So I'm going to show you how amplitude, uh, digital communication is much more simpler than analog uh, communication. Because here we are dealing with only zero and, and one, not a continuous uh, amplitude, which is uh, difficult to uh, correct. So here, for example, we have two 
1101. Suppose this is the, the message and we want to modulate this signal. So what we do is we just generate a high frequency current signal for our case, for example, a codine signal and transmit this message in chunks. So for example, when, uh, when the signal is one, we just transmit the, 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 the carrier. And if the, there is no signal, we don't transmit at all. So zero here, there is no transmission. One, there is transmission. So the receiver just needs to know the, 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 the sampling interval of the digital bit stream or in other way around, it just needs to know the bit rate. So that at that rate, it just samples to make sure that either there is a signal, so it's one, or there's no signal, it's a zero. As simple as that. This is amplitude modulation here because we are really essentially changing the amplitude of the carrier signal. The problem with this type of communication uh, as you might um, guess, is that it is not possible to determine whether the reason we get zero here, there, there is no output here, is whether it is because the, the transmitter is transmitting lots of zeros or because the, it, it has been uh, broken or it has been interrupted for, for, for some reason. So it is not possible to judge whether this is uh, zero is a normal uh, streams of zeros or an absence of communication. To avoid this, instead of communicating zero, some uh, amplitude shift key uh, modulators transmit uh, one amplitude for zero and another amplitude for one, but there is always a transmission so that it's possible to determine uh, the presence of communication. Okay, in uh, any type of modulation, we, we need uh, pulse uh, shaping uh, filter. That means uh, the, the digital signals here, digital signals are very uh, difficult to, to process in uh, electrical um, or uh, using electronic devices uh, for, this, uh, for the following reason. Uh, we always assume an instance of change between zero and one. So at this time, if you sample the signal at this time, the signal here can be considered either zero or one. And this change from high to low or from low to high should happen instantly. Uh, this is quite uh, expensive. Either we have to use highly accurate uh, electrical circuit or electronic uh, devices or transistors for that matter or we have to gently uh, modify the edges of the wave so that processing and communication of this signal is affordable uh, we, so that we can use affordable uh, electronic um, uh, components in the transmission and uh, reception of uh, bit streams can be made um, economic. For that reason, we need some pulse shaping uh, filter. A pulse shaping filter simply transforms the digital bit streams into gentle analog uh, signals so that uh, processing the uh, signal is uh, easier. So for example, as you see here, here we have uh, 1101. So these two signals will be now uh, represented by uh, these analog signals. The purpose of the uh, uh, pulse shaping uh, a filter here is to transform these bit streams into gentle analog uh, signal representing zero and one of course. Now it's possible to modulate this. Uh, you see the, the, the amplitude uh, uh, of the modulated signal follows the shape of the, the, uh, the, the pulses which are uh, shaped by the, the filter and uh, the modulated signal looks like this one, instead of a cleanly cut uh, zeros and uh, ones. This is by far economical, and it's possible to uh, modulate as well as process 
uh, this signal using uh, just off the shelf uh, analog devices. Okay, uh, frequency shift keying, uh, I told you a while ago, it is um, uh, more costly and more complex, but for digital communication, it's rather uh, straightforward. As I told you, in frequency shift keying, we change the frequency of the current signal according to the message. But again, in digital communication, since we are dealing uh, with only binary bit streams, so we just need two type of uh, frequencies. One high frequency signifying one, and one low frequency signifying zero. So we have to change the carrier, um, the frequency of the carrier signal according to these two levels only. So I'm going to show you here. So we have here, uh, two type of uh, carrier signals. One carrier signal having this uh, F2, another carrier signal ha having uh, another uh, frequency. So when it is one, we use either this, and when it's, uh, okay, when it's one, for example, we use this uh, carrier signal, or when it's zero, we use this one. So the, the, the switch simply switches between these two carrier signals according to the signal level of the, the message. So in the, in the end, what we get is analog signal, the frequency of which changes according to the, the message. Very simple, straightforward. The, the detection process is again uh, simple because uh, if it is uh, a high frequency, it will be recognized as uh, one. If it's a low frequency, it will be recognized as a zero. And a comparator always compares which of this uh, signal has a, a higher or a lower level to regenerate uh, or to reconstruct the original uh, bit string. So uh, digital communication has simplified uh, frequency shift uh, key. Similarly, in phase shift keying, the, the position of the uh, current signal changes according to the message signal. For example, if one is transmitted, there should uh, take place no uh, phase shift. But if there is a, a change, for example, if there is a change from one to zero or from zero to one, uh, to, this, uh, to signify this uh, change, we have to flip the, the, the position of the, the current signal. Again, digital communication has simplified uh, this type of communication. So this is how it takes place. For example, if we consider this uh, message signal, uh, use can see that uh, if, if we sample at this interval, for example, with the mouse uh, resters, uh, there is no transition in the signal level between these two. That means one, one is uh, transmitted. So that means there is no phase shift taking place. But here there is a phase shift because we are now changing from one to zero. To signify this, we flip the, the uh, current signal uh, phase at this point. So this flip simply signifies or indicates that the digital bit stream has changed now from one to zero. Again, here from zero to one. So again, we have to flip it uh, here to signify a change in the signal. Once this is done, again, we can transmit. So this refers to the change in the phase of the signal. If there is no phase shift, that means if zero, 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 zero are transmitted, so the, 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 the signal will be transmitted without any change. So whenever we sample at intervals and find no phase shift, we assume that uh, signals are, uh, you know, the same uh, bit streams are uh, transmitted. But when we sample and discover that there is a flip or a phase shift, we will uh, recognize this as a transition from zero to one or from one to zero. Okay, so you can see that here the, the, the transition, okay, here, this is again a, a phase shift, as you can see, 
uh, another form of uh, phase uh, modulation uh, using uh, pulse shaping circuits and then the, the same uh, principle uh, follows and this is the, the, the detection uh, process so if there is a flip there is a transition from one to zero if there is no flip there is no transition so either a stream of zeros or a stream of ones will be detected okay uh, so far we are we, we consider or we regarded only a single carrier signal modulating a single message signal in terms of efficiency uh, it's not efficient to use the whole medium to transmit only a single uh, carrier signal certain signals are considered to be orthogonal with one another if we add the fluctuation of the energy from minus infinity to infinity if the result is zero that means they don't interfere with one another these signals are said to be orthogonal orthogonal signals for example a sine signal and a cosine signal of the same frequency and the same uh, phase are considered to be orthogonal with one another that means if you transmit them simultaneously they don't interfere with one another so that means if they don't interfere with one another they don't distort or disturb each other's message so the the the, the transmission of orthogonal signals one, one of the, the the technique we use to transmit orthogonal signal is uh, quadrature amplitude modulation quadrature simply means um, 90 degree a phase shift of 90 degree so by uh, selecting signals orthogonal signals carrier signals we can transmit two messages at one time instead of just a single uh, message i will explain to you like this as i told you a sine wave and a cosine wave are by nature orthogonal to one another that means if you add and integrate the the, the energy uh, over a period of time uh, the output is zero that means they don't interfere with one another so here now we have two message sources one is called a quadrature uh, out of phase and one is uh, in phase so here is a one message here is another message we generate one carrier signal. The, the component responsible for generating this uh, carrier signal, by the way, is called oscillator uh, or a local oscillator. So this oscillator generates uh, this carrier frequency. For example, this is a cosine wave of frequency Fc. Now we can use a phase shifter to uh, produce from this cosine wave a sine wave of the same frequency. And these two signals are now in quadrature or they are orthogonal to one another we know that they don't interfere with one another now this carrier signal is is uh, used to modulate this signal to amplitude modulate this signal and this carrier signal is used to modulate uh, to amplitude modulate this signal and then we can mix them since the two are orthogonal to one, one another the mixture result is uh, two independent components which can be easily separated and then now we can use a single antenna to transmit this signal by this now we have increased the spectral efficiency of our uh, transmission this is the main principle of quadrature amplitude modulation now here we just used uh, uh, two uh, signals we can now use the, uh, we can combine amplitude modulation and phase modulation to support more complex uh, transmission schemes but in wireless sensor uh, network uh, we cannot afford to use advanced receivers and uh, transmitters that means it's sufficient to know quadratic amplitude modulation and not uh, uh, complex versions of 
uh, this one. Uh, but in 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 uh, mobile communication, for example, in uh, 4G and 5G uh, networks, we use more advanced uh, quadrature amplitude modulation techniques uh, to achieve uh, superior spectral efficiency and to support a high frequency, uh, so high bit rate, but the, the price for that is uh, high transmission power and complex transmission and uh, receiving uh, circuits. So I'm going to skip all this. Uh, if you are interested in, uh, you can uh, refer uh, advanced uh, uh, books on digital uh, communications. For example, this is the way we uh, detect uh, quadrature amplitude modulation. This is a, a mixture of sine and uh, cosine waves. Uh, so here is the, the local oscillator generating the cosine wave. Uh, we shift it to uh, produce a sine wave. In the same way we demodulate amplitude modulation, we do the same thing, but we now do it twice. So this one will be multiplied with this one to produce the, the, the sign component, the, the message signal modulated by the sign component. And we um, multiply this signal with the cosine wave to retrieve the message modulated by the cosine wave. The detection process is straightforward uh, and spectral efficiency is uh, better, but here now you can see that the, both the receiver and the transmission components are more advanced because now we have added here uh, a phase shifter. And uh, instead of a single uh, demodulator or detector, now we have used uh, two, uh, two mixers and two uh, detectors. Uh, there are, as I said, more advanced uh, quadrature amplitude modulation techniques, but we are not concerned with, with them. So I'm going to skip uh, this one. Okay, in summary, we have uh, considered the different uh, building blocks of a transmitter, beginning from the sensor, then the source encoder, channel encoder, uh, modulator. Uh, we have seen different types of uh, mechanism to maximize or improve um, uh, spectral efficiency. For example, the final one, which is the quadrature amplitude uh, modulation, which enables the propagation of two current signals at the same time uh, without interfering uh, one, uh, one another. Uh, we have also considered uh, different complexities in, in modulation, amplitude uh, modulation, frequency modulation, and uh, phase shift or uh, phase uh, modulation. Uh, phase modulation is extremely robust against noise, but the complexity, uh, it requires complex uh, transmitter and complex receiver, especially complex receivers to detect uh, the original, to recover the uh, original uh, signal. Uh, but in general for wireless sensor network, for example, at the channel uh, encoder, we don't need to recognize a uh, correct error. It suffices to recognize error and uh, order retransmission. We don't use advanced quadrature amplitude modulations because we want the sensor node uh, to be as simple as possible so that we can uh, support large scale uh, deployment. Uh, these are some of the design considerations we need to take into account when we put together the different uh, building uh, blocks of a wireless sensor node. Uh, Before I uh, complete this uh, session, I, I will briefly discuss about uh, signal propagation. Signal propagation uh, refers to the, the, the channel, the aspects of channel which we have to take into uh, consideration. Uh, different countries have different regulation which um, spectrum should be used for uh, what purpose. Uh, the spectrum we, uh, are interested in uh, wireless sensor networks, in cyber physical systems, in uh, Internet of Things, 
is the ISM band. This ISM band uh, is uh, dedicated for industry, uh, medical, and um, uh, science. That means you can freely use the, the spectrum, you can freely uh, uh, develop uh, uh, devices uh, which can use this spectrum without uh, the need for licensing. Uh, but it puts also uh, certain limits in terms of the power that can be uh, used by this type of devices because uh, since uh, it's a free band, uh, different technologies and different devices should coexist. That means the communication range is uh, typically below 100 meter and the, the, the transmission power should be below one watt. Because if uh, the, the power is increased, you may increase the transmission range, but the uh, interference uh, which can be caused by this device could also be significant to affect all other uh, uh, devices, which is not uh, acceptable. So we have to take uh, this spectrum uh, into uh, consideration. Since uh, I just told you the, the, the transmission power affects uh, and also can be affected by other uh, uh, transmitted uh, signals, it is important to know uh, a little uh, more about uh, signal propagation, as far, especially the relationship between the transmission power and the receiving uh, power. The, when we model a channel, as I told you, the channel could uh, subtract information from the electromagnetic signal or adds its own, inform its own noise into the electromagnetic signal. Uh, usually we uh, are interested in additive noise, not in subtracted noise. Additive noise simply means the, the, the surrounding environment has just meaningless energy coming from different uh, sources. And when this source is added into the electromagnetic signal, it can uh, flip one to zero or zero to, to one. And we model this noise as white, uh, additive white Gaussian noise. What do we mean by that? Additive, as I told you, it is added into the, um, into the signal. Gaussian means the amplitude of this signal at any uh, frequency, at any uh, spectrum, uh, has a normal distribution. So if, for example, uh, we are interested in 2.4 gigahertz, at that spectrum, the amplitude coming from the, from the noise from the surrounding has a normal distribution, a zero mean normal distribution. Typically, uh, with high probability, the, the noise is zero, but then in the neighborhood of zero, uh, in terms of millivolt, uh, you can find some uh, noise with a variable uh, probability. So it is important to understand the, the nature of this noise so that we can put in place the, the right uh, signal processing algorithms to, to remove this noise. So here we have the transmitted signal. This is the, the, the noise coming from the surrounding environment uh, and it, they are added, which is why we call it additive. And the magnitude of this signal, as I told you, is in the neighborhood of zero having a normal distribution, and this is the signal we, we receive. If we have knowledge of this signal, it's possible to subtract this signal to retrieve the original uh, signal. Uh, it's important to understand uh, the, the, the transmission power so that uh, we should take into account the factor which affect the propagation of this uh, signal. Uh, in order to improve the quality of the transmission power, it is important to uh, improve the, 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 the area of the antenna. 
the gain of the antenna refers to the ratio of the the output to the the input uh, the the gain is usually uh, uh, below one that means uh, if the gain is below one the output is less than the, the the input if we use some amplification then the gain is much much greater than one that means that the output signal is much much greater than the input signal so the gain of the antenna uh, is a function of the um, the surface area or the effective area of the the antenna if the effective area of the antenna is bigger then much useful signal can be propagated outside of the the antenna if on the other hand the the, the effective area of the antenna is uh, small then a big portion of the the transmitted signal will be lost in the form of heat and won't be propagated so this this formula here relates the the effective uh, uh, area of the transmitter with the with the gain so if we want a high gain we need to uh, increase the effective area of the the transmitter and again the there is a direct relationship between the wavelengths of the the propagated signal and the the effective area uh, so if the, the 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 shorter the the the, the antenna wavelength sorry the the shorter the signals uh, wavelength the the, uh, the a smaller effective area is sufficient to to propagate the the signal we have dealt this indirectly when we discussed about the about modulation so this this uh, formula is very very important relating the effective area of the transmitter the gain of the transmitter and the signal uh, the, the wavelength of the signal so you can see that the both gain and effective area are not constant uh, parameters instead they are uh, dependent on the wavelengths of the the signal uh, so here we have uh, the, the 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 transmitter here we have the receiver especially we are dealing we uh, here with the 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 signal received by the antenna this is the the power fed into the antenna uh, the antenna transforms the the electrical signal into electromagnetic signal so in a way it is a sensor changes electrical signal into electromagnetic signal without changing the frequency of the signal this signal will be propagated at uh, a distance of d meters the receiver antenna now transforms the electromagnetic signal into an electric signal so we compare these two powers the power fed to the antenna at the receiver side and the power received at as the output of the antenna and we want to relate this to to know how much of this power we can receive and how much of this power is lost we don't want much power to be lost because we want much power to be transferred because the the more efficient this antenna is the more likely it is to successfully receive a packet for a line of sight communication if there is no barrier between the transmitter and the receiver the the power the transmitter power falls at a rate of the square of a distance so there is an inverse relationship between the the power measured at any point here in the square of the distance so the power falls at a rate of the square of a distance for a line of sight communication when there is no light of communication uh, the power falls at a much higher rate so at the trans uh, at the receiver 
the relationship between the transmission power and the received power can be described by this relationship. So the receiver power, the, re the power received by the antenna is directly, directly proportional to the transmitter's power and inversely proportional to the square of the distance and some constant. As I told you, the, 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 the power also is directly proportional with the gain of the transmitter's antenna. If we increase the gain of the transmitter antenna, much power will be, much useful power will be received at the receiver. Uh, or we can also increase the effective area of the receiver antenna itself so that it can collect as much electromagnetic signal as possible. So effective, so that the trans, the receiver, the received power is directly proportional to the transmitter's power, the gain of the transmitter's antenna, and the effective area of the receiver. But it is inverse, inversely proportional to the square of the distance. But we have already uh, set a relationship between the effective area of the transmitter and the gain of the transmitter. So instead of this gain, you remember here, we have spoken about, uh, you know, about the relationship between the effective area of the antenna and the gain of the antenna. So we can make use of this expression to substitute uh, the uh, effective area as, as follow. So the transmitter, uh, so the receiver, the received power is now a function of the gain of the, uh, the, the, the transmitter antenna, the gain of the received antenna, the, sorry, the, the gain of the receiver, the gain of the, the, the transmitter and lambda. Now look, this, the first three component, PT, GT, GR are function of the hardware, function of the transmitter and the receiver. But lambda is the property of the signal being transmitted. So we want to separate this into two building block. If we rearrange terms now, we have, uh, we can express attenuation. Attenuation means the, 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 the ratio between the uh, received power and the transmitted power. Attenuation tells us how much power we have lost. So if, so the, sorry, the, 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 the attenuation is the ratio between the transmitter and the receiver power. If attenuation is high, that means we have lost much power. We want attenuation to be as small as possible. In other way, we want the received power to be as large as possible. If we rearrange terms, so this is what we get. Here, as you can see now, we have separated the, the signal component and the, 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 the distance, which is not a function of the hardware, and the hardware component. The gain of the antenna at the transmitter and the gain of the antenna at the receiver. So we have two big building blocks, one belonging to the, the signal and the transmission uh, distance, and another belonging to the, the hardware. If we use um, uh, a log uh, a logarithm expression, what we get is this one. In terms of dB, uh, that means decibel, we have one component dealing with the distance and the wavelengths of the signal, and another component uh, dealing with the, the, the antenna. This is a constant cost, and this is another uh, cost. So the and the, the attenuation of the signal tells us about the quality of uh, signal propagation and how this uh, is affected by the channel, uh, the transmission distance 
as well as the signals uh, wavelengths. This, uh, by this, we come to the conclusion of our uh, lecture for today. Uh, to briefly summarize, the physical layer focuses on point-to-point -point communication, which can very well be um, summarized by this picture or by this uh, figure. In this uh, model, our main concern is the channel because the channel uh, uh, includes its own noise and subtracts information, uh, vital uh, information from the signal. So we have to prepare the signal in such a way that um, it's robust uh, against the challenges faced by the wireless channel. For this, we introduced um, source encoders, channel encoders, and uh, uh, modulators. We also put in place a mathematical model so that we can um, tune the attenuation by tuning either the gain of the transmitter and the receiver's antenna or uh, tuning the, uh, the, the wavelengths of the carrier signal as well as adjusting the transmission uh, distance or the deployment uh, distance. Uh, thank you for listening. In our next session, we will deal with uh, the MAC layer. Uh, yeah, so this will be uh, the end of today's uh, lecture.